Hi everybody! Happy Friday! I hope everyone's as excited as I am to be doing this. Super pumped over here. Uh, just right before we start, and before we check the chat here, I want to say my plan is to stream Mandate of Heaven today and tomorrow, although tomorrow will probably be something, because tomorrow's a normal stream, probably something like two hours Mandate of Heaven, then an hour Democracy 3 to finish that Africa run, uh, the, the Kenyan one, um, and then our standard sort of multiplayer thing on Saturday, if we can cram that all in. I'm also hoping, hoping, hoping to find some time this weekend to finish the Prussian uh, Iron Man Let's Play in 1.19 before 1.2 officially drops. Cross our fingers there. Boom! Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. This is, first question, very important, then you miss, I don't know. Now, one of the things is, I gotta criticize the Europa team for this. The Stellaris team already has the patch notes out for patch 1.5 and Utopia. No patch notes yet for 1.20 in uh, in Europa. What's up with that? Hey, hey, hey. So as a result, um, I mean, I've read through all the dev diaries, which are pretty all-inclusive for a lot of changes. Um... But without the uh, the specific patch notes, there could be some some tweaks and changes here that we aren't uh, necessarily aware of. There might be some balance changes or something like that. But we're going to do our best to spot them as we go. Uh, play as Ryuku if you can. I actually had been playing an Iron Man Ryuku uh, for a while. It's it's actually quite fun. I managed to get the um, um, Colonialism Institution to spawn. I believe so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it spawned in, well, not here, because it can't spawn on Ryuku Island itself. You have to move your capital to somewhere that's not a single isolated um, island. So I think I moved my capital to, I think Manila or something like that, and I was able to get it to spawn. Um, I don't think it spawned in Manila itself. I can't remember, though. Uh, but yeah, and that was like a good setup for a good run. It was going to be very excited. But no, we are going to be playing as the nation of Ashikaga. Ashikaga. So, okay. Prior to this patch, if you were playing in Japan, you could play as either Japan, which is the nation that starts being the, as the shogun of the island of Japan, or you could play as, play as one of the 12 daimyos, okay? Um, and Japan started with 12 of these daimyos, which are sort of special vassals that are in there. Um, they, the, they, the, the vassals used a relationship slot, um, to offset that Japan or the Shogun, the Shogun, uh, government started with plus four Diplo rep, uh, um, relationship slots. Um, it still meant that Japan always started above their limit, but it was sort of balanced a little bit there. Um, and it was fine. I've, I've been, I've practiced before this was made available to me. I was practicing playing as Japan. Um, and it's, you know. A little dull because there's nothing really special going on. You manage some vassals every now and again, they declare war, you just smack them down, and eventually you either annex some people, uh, like Diplo annex some people, or you grab their land in war, and then you form Japan. It was fine. Things are a little bit different here in Mandate to Heaven because, first of all, there's no Japan. There's no nation of Japan at this point in the game. Um, the one, uh, the person who's the shogun of all of Japan is the person who controls Kyoto, which in this case is the nation of Ashikaga. Oh, so Ashikaga starts as the shogunate, and there are not 12 daimyos, there's 26 daimyos. I believe I have that, na that number correct. There are a crap ton more than before, but one of the changes is that daimyos no longer use a relationship slot. So we have our normal, we start the game at 0-4 relations, so that is going to be totally normal. The problem I'm wondering about, and I'm really concerned, is with 26 daimyos, there's a lot more threat of, um, of rebellion, maybe, so I'm not entirely sure what's going to go on there. We got a first tip of the day came in from Daniel Bansku. Thanks, Daniel! I had a, I had today in a math exam, but I had terrible headache midway through the exam, so I had to leave and go home. Not to see if I can redo it someday. Well, that's too bad. But hey, today's bonus stream, lightning my day. Well, there you go. There you go. Just don't tell anyone that you actually just got out of the exam so that you could go and watch the stream. Um... The changes to enforce peace in 1.18 or 1.19 made form in Japan slower. Yeah, um, now, here's the thing. Before, even before 1.20, which is what we're playing here, or 1.20, I guess I could say it. Um, before 1.20, it tended to be a lot faster you unified Japan actually as a daimyo. Starting as Japan itself was a little slower. And I think that's still going to be the case here. If you start as a daimyo, and particularly if you start as one of the bigger ones, like over here, you've got um, Yusugi? I don't know. Um, you have like a permanent CB on all the other daimyos. You can declare um, Sendoku 
and declare war on the other daimyos very easily all the time. I think you have a permanent CB on all the others, so you can war and take over some stuff. Um, as the Shogun, I do not have the ability to declare war on my vassals as is without doing, like, massive truce break and all those things. I don't know if I have the ability... Um, I don't think I can covert action them. Uh, I can build a spy network. So maybe I can I can uh, do claims and stuff like that. This is something that you could not do prior to 1.20. You could not build a spy network on one of your daimyos. Um, so that, that may be a change and that's something we can look into. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more of them. One interesting new interaction though with the daimyo vassals that you can do. There's actually a bunch of things. But notice this one here. Force seppuku. You can force your vassal your vassal's leader the daimyo himself to commit suicide um if they have declared a war on another daimyo uh you can force that leader to commit suicide which gets you monarch points equal to five times their skill it's like what so commit sudoku yes yes commit sudoku best button <laughs> um, there's a bunch of things here, like change isolationism. So one of the other big changes in this patch. So it does feature a lot of changes to um, to the eastern sort of empires over here. Um, and in particular, there's some changes to religion, uh, Shinto, uh, Confucianism, probably a few others have had some pretty significant changes to how they work. Um, and there's been a massive change to how sort of like the... I don't know, the, the, this area is, I don't know, the, the greater sort of Mingi, China, etc, etc, etc region works. In particular, I don't think Ming explosions are going to work the same as before, if they're going to work at all. Instead, there's an empire of China here. And currently, um, this dude, this dude who is the leader of, um, of Ming, the, the current king or, or emperor of Ming is the emperor of the greater China, which has 10 tributaries over here. You can pass a variety of reforms. China's now suddenly a lot more like the Holy Roman Empire, which is interesting. Um, different people can take over being the uh, the emperor of China, the, the, I don't know, the celestial empire, I suppose, uh, or emperor. Um, you can pass these different reforms. Um, there are ways to declare war for those t the title, as well as I think there's certain inheritance laws for it as well. Again, um, I, read, I read the uh, dev diary, but there was a lot of information in those. Um, what's interesting, this tributary system, this is new. Tributaries are sort of a really lightweight vassal that is most similar to being a, a prince in the Holy Roman Empire, um, in that, uh, tributaries are not forced to follow their overlord into war, um, they are allowed to have their own alliances, their own relationships, they can declare war with whoever they want, and all that kind of jazz. Um, there's just two gotchas with tributaries. One thing is that if someone outside of the sort of tributaries declares war on a tributary, then the overlord will get a call to arms. So it's just like the Holy Roman Empire. If you, someone, if, if um, France declares war ooh, on, on Ulm, then Austria will get a call to defend Ulm, for example. So same thing happens here. But the other big thing is that the overlord can request from the tributary that the tributary sends the overlord gold or manpower or any of the three monarch powers so you can say give me a bunch of admin points which is pretty crazy and then tributary can say yes or no depending on various things so um very very interesting new relationship this also really fits in very well wow, we're getting a lot of these tip explosions coming in uh this fits in really well with how the hordes operated historically when the hordes were heading west and were hitting like european territory they weren't just sort of burning and pillaging and doing all that um, willy-nilly. What they would often do with cities is they would force them to pay them tribute and, like, pay them tribute every year. Otherwise, we'll burn down your stuff. Um, and and that was very much how the hordes operated. So now that sort of behavior is in there, and I think that's going to be fantastic. But that is not the stuff I'm most excited about. Let's go and take a look at these little tips here, and then we're going to talk about what I'm really pumped for. Um, we got a tip in from Anonymous. Hey! Uh, Quilly Team, love the hat. Link me up. I want some Paradox gear. Uh, my fave right now is uh, Wajtek the Bear carrying a missile as a Hoi 4 reference. Keep up the great work. Love you. Oh, thank you very much. I got this I got this at Paradox Con two, three years ago. I'm trying to remember the timelines or not. I guess it's almost coming up on three years, I think. It was in, um, uh, it was in Sweden. 
And I got this hat, and I love it. It's great. And Cool Man Fight sent in a tip. Thank you very much, Cool Man. Here, take my magic to gather money for this month. And it's hot in Denmark. It's 17 degrees today. Good God, that's nice. It's snowing today. It's snowing today. Yeah, it's going to be snowing for like the next three days here, so. Okay. Uh, Sims 4 went. More Sims 4 will definitely be coming to the channel soon. It's this Sims 4 is probably the one where if I haven't put up an episode in a couple of days, I get the most emails and Twitch messages about. <laughs> People are so pumped for that series, and I'm having so much fun doing it. It's like a, it's like a sitcom soap opera. It's freaking awesome. Um, so hopefully soon, but probably not within the next couple of days. Okay, the last two big things that I can think about on my top of the head. Oh, a third thing. God, there's so many big changes. One, you may have noticed this thing up over here. Age of Discovery. The world of EU4 is now divided into four great ages, um, which is kind of awesome. Um, in each age, so we start in the Age of Discovery, there are a variety of things you can do that are like super awesome to accomplish in this age, like discovering America, um, having big control over a center of trade, having a really prestigious big city, embracing the Renaissance, for example. Having a feudal society, which is having five different vassals at the same time. We have 25, so we're okay there. Um, be present on two different continents and humiliate a rival. These are all things you can do to achieve sort of like check marks of how successful you are being in the Age of Discovery. As you do these, you start to accrue splendor each month. And you can use the splendor to activate the certain bonuses that last through the era. So, for example, we could implement the feudal de jour law which is, or de jure, I suppose, which gives you minus five unrest. Oh, it enables an edict that you can pass in your states, we're going to talk about edicts in a second, that give minus five unrest. Cost 800 splendor to, um, to unlock. We're currently earning a whopping three per month because we've completed one whole objective. These objectives, though, also lead into power projection. We can see we've got a plus three to our power projection currently because of completing objectives. So they're very cool. Um, there's also some uh, nation-specific ones, like um, the Ottomans here will have the guns of urban uh, Portuguese colonial growth for Portugal, Danish subject loyalty, liberty, desire, and subjects minus 30. Huge, huge change there in liberty, desire during the age of discovery. It's going to be very different um, look in uh, in Europe now, um, I think. And then Venetian trade node here, or tr Venetian trade if you're Venice, you have 50% more ship trade power. So that's in this age. This, we will switch over to the age referen uh, reformation um, once... Protestant has been around for 120 months, 10 years. It'll go there. In the Dev Diary, it said these ages were locked to specific times. This does not seem to be the case anymore. Instead, they are locked to some amount of time after an event triggers. Um, so there's things you can do there. There's this uh, Golden Age. If you've got three objectives fulfilled, you can enact a Golden Era here and get a huge, huge amount of bonuses. There's also different rules for different ages as well. Um, that you can do. There's certain some things are allowed in some ages and not in terms of religious conflict, absolutionism. So much stuff. It is going to be a pretty dramatic change to the game. You guys still following me? The age of referendum. <laughs> All right. Next thing. We're going to save the best for last. The best for last. The next thing is there has been a tweak to the province panel here in that they've broken up the province tab. So now we're looking at the province of Kyoto and then the state of Kine over here. So this is our overview of the state itself. There's also a map mode for state's information as well, which is going to be quite nice. This shows us the state income, the state maintenance, which is really nice. This is the prosperity of the state, which is related to the new devastation mechanic, which we'll probably talk about once we get into war. You can pass edicts for a state. Any of these edicts will triple the maintenance cost of the state, although that's not very much, for a variety of bonuses, like increased institution spread. Um, you can see that local unrest one that we could do if we unlocked that ability, for example. Protect trade. Hey, 50% more local trade power, and so on and so forth. Lots of really powerful edicts over here. Really like it. It also shows you the, the name of all the... Um, of all the provinces in this state over here, as well as who owns them. Lovely, lovely, lovely little view. Okay, here's the thing I'm most excited about. Are we ready? Are we ready? So, you know your macro builder over here, right? Where you can quickly build, like, units over here, uh, boats. You can look at the core. I don't think I've ever used this core thing. Send missionaries, autonomy, etc., etc., etc. The building screen. So, normally, back in the day, when you were on the building screen, and let's say you hit marketplace, what it would do is it would show you on the map 
all the provinces where you can build the marketplace. And it would also show you a number that would show you how much of a change it would make. And that's still the case. Actually, probably the best example is Temple, right? Because if I click this and you look at the map, um, well, I can't build Temple anywhere, so it's not actually going to show me a pop-up. But it would, you know, show me like, oh, if you build it here, you'll get an extra 0.1 ducat per month. Okay? And that was always very handy. But what's way handier is this over here. Right? So now when I click on Taxation, not just do I get the map view, but I get a list of every single one of my provinces. How much it would cost to build the building in that province, and how much I would earn from that. And these things are sortable! What? I mean, there's nothing to sort right now, so it's kind of moot. Um, but there we go. See, you can you can sort this. Um, oh, sort by free slots. So that's helpful. And then, yeah, sorting by how much money you would get from this. Ah, oh, this had me excited because I saw Johan post a, a screenshot of this on Twitter. And I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. This is not the greatest thing ever. The greatest thing ever is this tab here. This diplomacy tab. Don't get me wrong. I'm super pumped about the building. You know, it's so nice playing a strategy game that cares about the user interface. I mean, I'm not going to say that I ever get salty about certain other strategy games with obvious deficiencies in their user interface. But yeah, anyway, diplomacy. This thing. Oh. oh, it's so good. This is the diplomacy macro builder interface. I mean, it's part of the macro builder, but it's not really building. But it's a good spot to put it. I mean, first of all, it's just exactly the right size to fit in here nicely, and that's good and very satisfying. Okay, there are many tabs here related to various things. They do very, very different things. I'm going to look at the, um, say, the dynastic actions tab first. The dynastic action tab will show you um, how many... So this is royal marriage. Let's say it's the start of the game. You want to know who you can marry, right? So you're going around, you're right-clicking on things like... Oh, no, see, they're not willing to do it because they hate me too much. Oh, okay, so you right-click on another. Oh, they'd be able to do it, and so on and so forth. Well, now, now you go here, and you go there, and you say, Oh, 20 people are willing to accept my royal marriage. Here's the list of all of them. It highlights on the map everywhere that's green. They want to marry me. They want to get some of this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And here's a list sorted by relationship. <laughs> and then other things. Claim throne. Um, who would be willing to share maps with you? Um, who would be willing to give you trade power, right? Oh my god, that's so good. Um, these here are, are grayed out for us because, say, we're not the papal controller. But this is like, show me a list of everyone I can excommunicate. Ooh. Emperor actions, who show me everyone I can, I don't know, ask them to release a country or something. You know, all the, the things the emperor of the HRE can do. Great power actions, once you're a great power. Who can I influence? Who can I um, intervene in wars for? And things like that. Amazingly good amazingly good so you've got all this so for all these various actions here okay uh who can i annex or who can i offer vassalization to that's interesting um oh someone the oirat horde will let me become their tributary that's interesting i don't want to do that because they're very unlikely to be in a position where they could protect me from outside threats um, and all they would do is ask me for, like, power points or gold or something like that. So I'm not going to do that. But it's interesting to be able to see that at a glance. Uh, the Alliance screen, that will be very handy later on. Early on, I don't know how many options we're going to have for that, but, <laughs> um, it is nice. And then you have this tab here. The first tab on this, Improve Relations. This one is different from all the others. What this lets you do, this lets you automate your diplomats. So you can say, listen, I always want to have, say, three diplomats that are always going out and trying to improve relations with my subjects. That's what they do. They will improve relationships with the subject until, until it hits the cap, and then they will go and they will pick another subject and bring it up and repeat and repeat. Or neighboring countries, or countries that threaten me. You know what? Maybe what we want to do is we always want to make sure to have someone sucking up to countries that might hate me and declare war. Like, oh my god! That's so good! It's so good! Now, the first thing that people bring up with this is, can I have, is there something that automates spying? And the answer is no. And I can see why that's the case, because I think there's too many possible political ramifications to having an AI controlling where you spy in terms of failures and ticking people off. And then it would be nice maybe if you could like set something to like always spy on France whenever I can, because you get kicked out and then you can't go back for a while and then you forget to send it back. That might be nice, but it doesn't really fit into this UI the same way. Um, and, like, I'm not gonna complain that we don't have enough. Yeah, the auto resend, like, maybe there's something that can be worked out that way, but it'd be weird, because what if you, like, so you do it, and then 
the what do you do? You let the, the diplomat sit idle for six months and then go back. Like, it's something where some people won't be happy with the behavior one way or another. This is fine. Um, apparently the AI, uh, especially even like say neighboring countries, it'll prioritize countries that don't already hate you to the max. So countries that you have hope of actually getting a decent relationship with, it'll prioritize like a closer countries, bigger countries, more dangerous countries. So basically what you would normally do to try to do this. Um, and in particular, I'm going to be really excited with this because I have, I guess I have 25 vassals. So I want automated vassal like handling uh, for sure. But first I'm going to do a little bit of manual thing. I'm going to go to dynastic here. I'm going to go to royal marriage. I want to highlight, oh, actually I'm going to take a look at the mission. Incorporate Imagawa into our country. Uh, so which one is Imagawa? Fine. Imagawa is, ah, this one right over here. So I, I have a mission to incorporate them to my country. So I'm going to say yes to this. Actually, I'll just double check they don't hate me. No, they don't hate me. Good. So incorporate them. Excellent. Um, and certainly we're going to send them a royal marriage as well. That's going to be fine. And we are going to look for more royal marriages. I, what I'm thinking is I'm going to try to pick up um, small country, small uh, nations near me. I'm going to royal marry them and then see what we can do. Because I don't think we can ally... No, you can't, we can't ally our vassal. We got a minus a thousand to that. Um, no matter what, no matter how much they like me, we cannot ally our vassals. So we're not going to have any alliances, so that's fine. So the only priority with royal marriages is, I mean, maybe it affects their ability to declare war against me. That might be a thing, but I'm interested in sort of sucking up to these, um, these tiny, tiny little dudes so that I can, um, um, incorporate them later. Do they like me? No. So they don't like me. They don't like me. And there, I mean, there's not a whole lot. See, everyone who's like bigger than a couple or bigger than one province, apparently, does not like me enough to do a royal marriage. So that's fine. That's fine. I, I don't. I don't like them anyway. That, that's okay. Uh, so I'm going to do you. Uh, I think I can just click here. It very easily send it as well. But I'm I'm using the visual kind of way of doing it. Uh, we're gonna do you. Excellent. And we're going to do you. So th this whole block over here. These are going to be my best friends right here. I have decided. Um, so I found Japan pretty easy to play before 1.20. I have no idea how to play them here in, and now that this has come out. There's so many people. I don't know what the politics are going to be. Um, one of the crazy things now in the Shinto religion, I said we were going to mention, um, is that Shintoism has a, a value for isolationism that can go from 0 to 4. So there's five levels from 0 to 4 where... Um, uh, zero is open doors, not isol isolationist at all. Open doors, you welcome other people. They're kind of, I think, uh, at zero, I think you get a discount to technology and institution spread. And then all the way up to the max of four, uh, there you get a bonus to like stability and discipline or something like that. Um, at the cap, or it might be even negative unrest. I'm not sure. It's something like that. It doesn't seem to be a way to just list it here, but the, the dev diary and the wiki will have that information. Um, your vassals like you more if they have the same degree of isolationism, which right now we do. Right now we do. But there's going to be a slew of these possible incidents that may push us more or less isolationist, depending on what we decide to do about that, which is going to be fan freaking taxing. Oh, less war exhaustion at max isolationism. Thank you very much. Uh, we got a tip in from Big Bean. Hey, thank you very much, Big Bean. Hey, Quill, huge fan. Love watching you play all the Civ games. Reminds me of how much fun I had as a child playing Alpha Centauri in Civ 3. Oh, yeah, that I started playing again. Do you like tequila? Um, I don't do tequila shots. What I like about tequila are, are margaritas, proper margaritas. Not like the frozen mix that are mostly sugar, but a proper margarita. Oh, that, that is nice. That is nice. All right, we have to set a rival. The only option we're going to have is Ming. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't rival them. They rival us. We're not going to be friends. Boom. Ming, you smell bad, and I don't like you. All right, money-wise, we start off doing pretty okay at 2.88. Mostly, that's because of the money we're getting from our vassals. Huge money from our vassals, which makes me wonder, um, should one of our first ideas we go for be, um, is it influence ideas? Yeah, influence ideas. The very, very first one is 25% more income from vassals. No, it's not bad. I don't think we care about aggressive expansion. Um, the Diplo annexing cost, depending on when this comes in, could save us a lot. 
I don't know. There's, of course, the idea of going very early exploration, you know, trying to discover the Americas. Um, that's possible. There's plenty of land to colonize. A lot of people in chat earlier were saying they wanted exploration ideas. I suspect that will be uh, quite common. Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> Good point. Yeah, how strong is Ming in terms of that uh, rivalry? Can I still get that number here? No, I only got it on the other screen, but Ming is pretty powerful. We can take a look at the ledger. There have been some changes to the ledger. There's now a filtering system. Ah, here we go. 